Alpha. Welcome to the live stream, guys. We have a Black Friday week basically going on of live streaming activities. So I'll be here hosting this entire thing. I've got Marlon and Richard here. Hi, everybody. They are joining me here. We'll go into them in a little bit of a second. Um, I'm just going to quickly run you guys through a couple of things. So Black Friday deals, I'm not really going to go through them much here. Uh, but what we will be covering in these live streams is the, the gear that is on Black Friday deals. Um, and that's what we will basically be focusing on. Um, but the Black Friday deals themselves, you need to go check with the specific retailers. But just to give you an idea, you can save up to 12 and a half thousand Rand on G Master Glass. Um, and then obviously all the bodies except for the A7C and the A7S3 because they're currently already on promotion because of the pre-order. So those are the only models that are actually not on Black Friday currently. So right now I'm going to I'm going to give over to Richard and Marlon. They're going to take away this entire thing and then we'll we'll just see how it goes. Cool. So go for it. Good evening everyone. My name's Marlon. What's up guys? I'm Richard. I'm really stoked to be here with you guys. Thanks for the introduction, Herman. I think it's going to be a great night. We're going to take you through what's in our bags and how we as wildlife photographers like to pack. And the first thing I like to pack is an A92. And cameras are very important to me and A92 being the pinnacle is just an incredible camera. The way it changed and everything is brilliant, but we're going to take you through some images. So I'm going to hand over to Marlon. Marlon, tell me what, what you like about this camera. Absolutely, Richard. I think it's it's one of the most important things is what you pack in your bag as a wildlife photographer. And absolutely, one of the first things we consider, one of the first things we reach for is our main or our prime camera body, which in this case is the Sony A9 Mark II. And it is a phenomenal camera. And it's one that has grown on me um, like no other camera has, and for very good reason. And we'll jump straight into it. If you look at this first um, photograph that I'll share with you and just talk about this photograph and what the A9 has been able to do is, I took this last week um, at a place called Zamanga here in South Africa, an incredible hide experience, perfectly suited to the A9 II because you need a camera able to, to shoot in low light, um, get away with high ISOs, have very sharp autofocus, and exactly what this image shows in details here. You can see this is an African jacana. It stuck its head underwater. In other words, this moment of lifting its head is, happens in a split second and it picks its head up out of the water and the A92 tracks it perfectly with incredible detail and couple that with the 400 f2.8, the lens which this image was taken with, you end up with an amazing image. Richard, for yourself, Dude, I am in love with this camera because of dynamic range. And as your image showed, it is so crisp and clear in terms of its quality. But dynamic range, as a wildlife photographer, we're always shooting in strange lighting conditions. In the middle of the day, when it's hot and everything, everything's lying flat. It's at dusk and dawn that things are really happening. And in this image, you can see how these cheetah are caught at Mashatu in the dipping light as the sun was setting. And it's very difficult. Our eye sees it perfectly, but as soon as we lift the camera, it becomes tough. Now, with the ability to look through the electronic viewfinder and see my histogram, I can then plan my shot out, expose it correctly. The animals were a little underexposed, but in post, be able to bring that back because there's so much dynamic range, there's so much detail in that whole image that I can balance that out like that. So. Marlon, what's your next image that you're going to chat about? Richard, for me, the game changer with the Sony A9 Mark II, what really sets it apart is the fact that it can track the animal's eyes for me. Now look at this photograph. This is a Jaguar in the Pantanal in Brazil. And what truly stands out for me in this is, is the image quality and everything else, but the fact that it tracks the eyes unwaveringly, even with possible obstructions in front of the cat, behind the cat, even with excessive movement. Um, the fact that my, my cat or, the, or whichever subject I'm photographing, the eyes are always sharp, not only makes sure that I have a great image, it also allows me to focus on things like composition, what my settings are, exposure, because traditionally you're so focused on getting your focus point aligned to the head or the eye of the animal that you can't spend as much time on the other important features of that photograph. So this frees you up and, and it's deadly accurate. It doesn't let you down. It really allows you to, to focus on other things while the camera makes sure that the eyes of your subject is perfectly tracked, Richard. Totally, totally agree with you. Even in this image, um, one of the things that you have to remember is that composition, that 
being able to lock focus. Now, the eyes of a rhino are pretty small, but it'll find the head then. And once you've locked focus, you can then recompose. And then I love the fact that I can shoot at 20 frames a second. 20 frames a second means that I'm not missing a moment. And I'm also shooting without lossless. There's no blackout. So I can see the action all the time. It's locked on. It's refocusing 60 times a second. So between each photo at 20 frames, it's refocusing three times. So you're getting the most accurate thing. And that allows me to choose the exact image that I want to portray this moment, which was a rhino that was trying to mate with another rhino sun behind beautiful dust and it had just fallen off after trying to mount on it but obviously within this the a9 ii is all about speed but a perfect companion camera is the a7r4 and you don't want to miss what we're going to say here but i'm going to give it to Haramon because he's going to give a little update quickly and then we'll hand it over to marlon so just to update you Pretty much everything is on Black Friday deals except for the A7C and the A7S3 because they're already on promotion, but you can check with your retailer. So, Harman, speaking about comments and questions, one of the, the most common comments or questions that I tend to get is, which one do we choose? Do we go for the A7R4 or do we do the A9 Mark II? Which camera is best suited? And the beautiful thing is, if you can, you should not even think about not having both. Both of those cameras will complement your photography of the A9 II like Richard said, for autofocus and speed. And then you have the, the A7R4. Now I've been using cameras for the last 12 years and this next image will show um, a, a, an ordinary subject just made to look so beautiful and striking. The A7R4 has got image quality like I've not seen on any other camera. And it's not a matter of which one is better. The A92 is fantastic for the purpose for which it has been built. And the A7R4 for image quality, dynamic range, and incredible image detail and quality is, is there's no competition for that camera on the market. And this photograph here just shows that incredible detail, incredible image quality. And even the next shot, it's a, it's a kind of um, camera that you should have with you as a second camera, undoubtedly, because you can pair it with lenses, whereas the A92 might be occupied on a telephoto lens for obvious reason. The A7R4 is free on images like this. This is an image that you require detail. It's, it's not so much about the animal as what it is about the landscape and the environment around you. And it's a perfect companion for that because you can shoot scenes like this, this tiger captured in Ranthambore, incredible landscape. You want to be able to zoom in and look at the temple in the back and the structures behind. It allows you to, to explore the scene and the A7R4 with the detail and the image quality that it captures is the perfect camera for that. Richard, for yourself, um, the next camera, which is something that not a lot of people considers as a wildlife camera, but you've had great experience in this. Well, so the RX-10, I, I, through lockdown, took one home with me and I had obviously a lot of time to fiddle around. And what we decided to do was I did a, a bird photography workshop to try and figure out what this camera was all about. And we want to highlight this camera because of the fact that Everyone looks at the bigger, more expensive, the A92, the A7R4, and they can be expensive. And this guy comes in at a different price level altogether. And what it does and what it did, delivers is incredible. From 284 millimeters at 2.8 to 600 f4. It is like having my entire camera bag wrapped up in one parcel. And you can see the quality on this rainbow lorikeet picture here. And it is just amazing. One little camera with everything all about it. So if you're not in the market for the bigger stuff, this is definitely something to think about. And on my last trip where I was doing guide training, it, it was definitely a favorite amongst a lot of people because of its ease of use and its ability and the ability of the photographers to be able to get around it. I think you know, lenses is something that a lot of people question when it comes to the mirrorless world. And I can assure you that Sony will not let you down. It is another common question. Do they have enough lenses? Can I find what I have in my current setup in the Sony lens setup? Absolutely, you can. We're going to go through a number of lenses that's perfectly suited and designed for wildlife photography. And starting with this lens here, the Sony 600 f4 G Master lens. I am, I've been using the 400 f2.8 for the last uh, 10 years or so and the 600 as well in addition to that. And when I stepped up to the Sony 600 F4, not only did the weight of it blow me away, just about three kilograms for 600 mm lens. I mean, that's unbelievable, the lightest 600 in the world. And add to that the autofocus speed and the image quality 
and the bouquet and the edge-to-edge -edge sharpness. It just doesn't stop, Richard. Um, look at this image of a tiger captured in Ranthambore. The throw of that bouquet, um, uh, the focus on the where it needs to be, the eyes and the head, and just a beautiful um, uh, rendition of soft bouquet towards the rest of the frame. It is a lens unlike any other 600 in the world and something that will complement your wildlife images like you won't believe. And obviously, adding to that, if you're looking at longer lenses like that, we're talking birds, and again, the bouquet is beautiful, but its ability to focus really fast and to maintain things, these little bee eaters don't sit still for long. And when they sit on a branch, they're always flying off and coming back and you're trying to get things but finding the right background and being able to pull your subject out with the detail that you can in this. And on top of that, with these stabilizing elements that you can handle, three kilograms, I, even with my little skinny pins, I can handhold the thing. So it's a brilliant lens to use and it gives you a different dynamic. Obviously your smaller things become larger because we're now able to zoom. Absolutely. And, and this image is another one that I took, um, try to get for you guys specifically for this event to showcase um, the sharpness of this lens and just how fast it reacts. Richard speaks about the speed of this, this lens. Couple that with the A92. It is an unbelievable combination. And I'm not lying when I tell you, I can't remember the last time I fluffed a photograph or made a mistake because the autofocus system of the A92, the, the speed of the 600 F4, and the ability to capture shots like this. I mean, that is unbelievable detail. I can't explain how fast that happens. If you've ever watched a bird fishing, it is um, you know, within the blink of an eye and it's over. So the fact that you add the frame rate of the A9 to the autofocus and, and tracking speed of the 600 will give you images like this, Richard. And then on top of that, the 600 is a great portrait lens, especially within wildlife. And um, in the reserves that we get to, we get quite close to things and you don't want to be too wide on certain stuff. So being able to get in and this buffalo here was a big thing. The ox picker busy whispering sweet nothings in his ear, but it's about that power and being able to get right in there. And the detail is just incredible. The sharpness of these lenses blew me away from day one. The moment I picked it up and shot for the first time with any of these G Master lenses was just an absolute mind blower. Um, we have a question here. We've touched on some bird photography stuff. Um, and I see a question here from Jeff, or actually two questions from Jeff. Um, the one question is general setting guidelines for bird photography, and the other one is bird photography setting guidelines. So it's, it's more or less the same thing. Can you guys maybe go ahead and, and comment, uh, comment on that? I think it, it depends on uh, the situation, but for the most part, we're talking shutter speed. I, I think. In wildlife photography, we're talking shutter speed and birds because they flit so much, that would be my feeling and making sure you have a little bit of depth of field to get everything yeah. in focus. What's Absolutely. Opinion? So um, the most important, there's three, I mean, we're talking aperture, we're talking ISO and shutter speed. And birds typically, the closer you are, the telephoto lenses, you don't have a lot of uh, room and depth of field to play with. So like Richard said, I think if you can hover around that F8 to F11 mark, just to ensure sharpness, at least most of the head and the body is sharp and in focus. Um, you need shutter speed. And with shutter speed, if you set a 2,500 or 3,200 of a second, what automatically happens at F8, at F10, and a shutter speed of 3,200, you're going to have to pump your ISO. So don't be afraid of it. If you use something like the A92, the previous shot you just saw of the heron catching the fish, that was at an ISO in daylight of 3,200. It doesn't quite make sense. But it's the only way to achieve an aperture of f8 or f9 that shutter speed you need to compensate with iso but the a92 makes it easy because it handles noise beautifully as you could have seen in that previous shot exactly and i think that's the biggest part you've got to realize guys is that iso is almost a misnomer now at this point where these cameras have got to it doesn't make a difference anymore it's all about the uh, shot and getting the right settings your iso yeah. everything's so clear so we're going to talk about the next lens, which is the 400 2.8. And Marlon, this image of yours is just awesome. I love the light. <laughs> Thank you. Richard, like, this is a special shot. It was, uh, again, in, in Brazil, the Pantanal and a toucan backlit by the sun. Now, if you look at that bull and beak of a toucan, I kept seeing this backlit scene and trying to get it in this posture was, was you know, not always that easy. And you had to pick the shot very well. 
It was with the A92 and the 400 f2.8. And what I love about this is it complements again to the A92 is the, the, the dynamic range, the fact that it balances the darks and this very well sunlit build so well. And that's something a lot of photographers take for granted. Making sure dynamic range is in place um, up to 15 stops is very important and makes your editing so much easier. But the A92, the, the crispness, again, the autofocus, this bird um, uh, through that back so quickly, the bouquet of the 400, the sharpness of the 400 just makes these kind of photographs a pleasure to take. Totally. And, and what I love is the low light ability. Being able to shoot with a 2.8, especially when you're in the jungle. So this was in Uganda and you're following the chimps around. You've got this massive canopy over. It's a rainforest. They call it that because it rains a lot. But there's often cloud cover because of that. So very little light. This was shot at, I think, 250th of a second, handheld with a 400 2.8. So you, you're dealing with incredible glass and it gives that bokeh that allows me to separate subject from background and foreground. I'm shooting through the leaves. And this was one of very few opportunities that you will ever have to shoot a baby chimp. Marlon? Absolutely. And Richard, just to add to bokeh and, and, and just that incredible depth of field, yet magnificent sharpness on the subject itself. If you look at this frame, um, this leopard, an important thing that not a lot of people notice, this, this late afternoon sunlight, the darks can be really dark and the light part, the sunlit part is very difficult to balance. But the 400 and the image quality achieved through the 400 um, made it easy. And look at the tail. It's often detail that's missed in the shot. If you look at the shadow part, the tail in the back, you still see spots. You still see detail in the tail. It's something not a lot of people notice, but the 400 retains both. Incredible image quality and, and highlights on the cat itself, but it doesn't lose the, the actual detail and, and um, light on the background. It's a magnificent lens and a lens that, that I will always take and be confident to take wherever I go. Totally. And, and I think just as a background on that is that we get this ability to also see what the photo is going to look like through the EVF. That electronic viewfinder gives us a real-time view of how your exposure is. So you're able to change that in camera while you're looking. That's a very big detailed part. Again, the ability of this lens, detail within this lens, and you see this leopard and the drop of bokeh behind, it just allows the subject to pop. It makes everything the hero. You don't even have to work hard. And the speed of focus, if it moves, the eye auto focus, like Marlon was saying earlier, one of the eyes, whichever eye is closest, it will lock onto. So you never lost, especially at 2.8, you don't want to be lost with the wrong eye in focus because you will lose the image very quickly. So being able to have this sort of detail, this crispness, all in one neat, very light body, it is my favorite by far. And I use it a lot with the 1.4 teleconverter, which we'll talk about later, which gives me my 600 F4 at the same time. So I think we're going to move on now to a really amazing lens, a 200-600, which is a 5.6 through um, 6.3. And Marlon's used it a lot, so he's going to explain an image or two about this image, about this lens. Absolutely. Guys, I know what a lot of you are thinking, um, that budget is an issue, and sometimes it is. You know, like the reality is not many can afford to spend you know, upwards of $12,000 on a lens. We understand that. But Sony's got you covered. If you can't do that, the following two telephoto lenses, I was incredibly surprised by them. The 200, 600 being one of them. For the price point that that lens finds itself within, the, the, the build quality, the structure, the throw on the autofocus, how e literally in one throw, you can go from 200 to 600 mil. The image quality is just spot on with, that, they, with the 200, 600. Sony's done it right here. So it fits the budget and it is an incredible lens to have. If you look at the shot like this, the, what you often miss out on in the telephotos is the ability to capture the whole scene. And what it does here very easily is you can go from all the way 200 all the way to 600. So it becomes a great storytelling lens because you can capture more of the content. If I were on a 400 or 600 here, perhaps I would have had only half of the interaction here. But being able to have that focal length, the image quality, the build structure of the 200, 600, and that price point makes it a, a really good combination and a fantastic lens to have for wildlife photography. And it's light. It's a little bit longer than the 100 to 400. It's small, it's light, and in today's world, that's exactly what you need. Exactly. 
Now on to the 100-400, and I chose an image here that would describe it in a different sense, because when I changed over, as Marlon was saying, not everyone has that money to change over, and as a professional photographer, we're always looking for the balance. So I didn't want to dive too far in. I did immediately once I picked everything up, but my first lens was the 100-400, and it blew my mind. One of the most amazing features is that it focuses at less than a meter. So this image was taken at f11 at less than a meter of this Darwin spider in Madagascar. And the detail in this thing just blew me away. Wildlife, it, it just brings everything to. And I never expected it. I've shot with a lot of the 8400s, the 100-400s from different brands. And there is no way that I ever got detail like this off of those lenses. This thing is absolutely spectacular. And this photograph of a, of a mother and its calf was taken at 5,000 ISO with a 70 to 200. Now, if you're a, an existing wildlife photographer, I'm almost confident that you're going to have a 70 200 f2.8 in your bag. Now, Sony has one for you, and it's a beautiful lens. It's incredibly sharp. Um, it's a little bit smaller than the traditional 70 200s, and the results are magnificent. This is a photograph I took a few days ago in a hide um, uh, at ISO 5000, yet the image quality of, of um, that lens and what it produces and how well it works with both the A92 and the A7R4 will leave you with a big smile on your face. Exactly. And again, I, I go back to the gorillas because it's, it's a tough environment to work in. Up in the rainforest, when you're walking around, not always is a big lens handy. And we get so close to these things. And my go-to lens is a 70 to 200. Besides that, when I'm sitting with my A92 with the 400 fixed on it, I need a bit of room to play around with. So I'll, I'll automatically pick up that as a second body to be able to capture any wider stuff that I need. But this Gorilla is a great example. You know, being able to get close to these things is spectacular. But being able to capture the detail and the essence of a situation of this silverback lying down in the grass is all due to that lens. That lens is so easy. I pick it up, my A92 says, thank you, I autofocus, go straight onto his eye, and I can then compose and look at how the image looks and feel it out, and I can trust that that lens is gonna give me the best images that I could possibly hope for. Absolutely. And, and this next lens, guys, I believe as a wildlife photographer, you should keep experimenting, you should keep trying new things. And what I love about my mirrorless journey is even to this day, I've been shooting with Sony since um, June 2019. And to this day, I'm rediscovering the autofocus system. I'm trying new lenses because it just behaves differently to my DSLRs. Um, and it has really changed um, the world of wildlife photography for me. And a lens that I'm enjoying, absolutely enjoying, is the Sony 135 f1.8 G Master lens. Now, this is a very special lens. It is very fast and it's really sharp, incredibly sharp. And in addition to that, it's got two linear autofocus mechanisms in a very small lens. How they've done that is unreal, but the value they've given you in that lens. Now, you might think this is a great uh, portrait lens or outdoor events lens or concert lens or why wildlife? Well, look at this photograph. The, 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 what I have in my mind to create with this lens is just beautiful portraits. Uh, shooting animals up close, using the depth of field to my advantage and creating just very moody, uh, soulful images that just speaks to an audience that looks great on a wall, uh, images that just absolutely stop you and make you think about the shot. And having depth of field at your disposal, like you do in this lens, allows you to create. I can tell you and show you what you should see by throwing out the background or including it. So it's a beautiful lens for that. And even this next photograph, um, I'm not sure. No, there was only one. Yeah. But that's what I wanted to say. The, um, <laughs> it's just a beautiful lens to create. We create as wildlife photographers, and that's what that lens allows you to do. And I think what Marlon is getting at is such a very valuable point for all photographers. Is we, we've put things in boxes. 135 is a portrait lens. This lens is for a landscape photographer. This lens is for this guy. It's, it's about mixing things the more you learn about different forms of photography the more you can create different images different things and another lens that always comes with me is a 2470. as a wildlife photographer we are in spectacular landscapes 
This was taken off a hot air balloon in sausage flay overlooking the deserts and the dunes and everything. And, you know, you, when you're in this situation, you want to capture space and that lens just allows that. Plus, if I have an animal close by, I have that ability to go to 70 mils, create a portrait, move things around and create the mood I need with the entire lenses. The next lens we're going to talk about is a 16-35. And I know Marlon and I both love this lens. Yeah. So Marlon, tell me about this next image because this was a cracker. <laughs> I had to include it. I've shared it before and some of you may have seen it. But it's the lens that you're not going to use all that often. I'll be honest with you. All right. So it's not going to be the telephoto lens. It's not going to be the 7200. But it has to be in your bag. Either that or 2470. But I love the 1635 and it's always with me for this very specific reason. Had I not had it, it would have been impossible to capture this photograph at 16 mil at f2.8. A leopard with the stars behind it, one shot, not a composite, not, not uh, in, ca in camera, double exposed, nothing like that. It's one photograph, just cleverly lit. But the 1635 and the quality that you can get from that lens is unreal. And you have to have it. You have to have a wide, whether it's a 2470, 1635, it's such a great complement to wildlife photography. And there will be a time, trust me, when you're going to reach for that wide and, and, and actually use it. Like this next photograph, a stunning shot, Richard. Thanks, Marlon. And so I decided to show a different side of it because I use the 1635 a lot for Astro. And it's one of those lenses, again, I, I enjoy all forms of photography and being able to shoot stars is great. But this gorilla was mm. on its way to me. And one of the thought processes was to try and create something different. So how do you create something different? You either change your settings or change your perspective. And your perspective can be that wide. And what happened was I actually waited for this lady to come up. And as she started moving, I had my live view open, tilted my screen up so I could hold it right to the ground, let the eye autofocus do its thing, and open it up to 16 mils. And it makes her feel big. It gives a very different perspective to everything and changes the world. So don't be shy of different lenses for different reasons. And then we're going to go on to the last thing, which is the teleconverters, because this has been a misnomer from the beginning of my Absolutely. photographic career. That was always the cheapest option to get length. Yeah. But you always lost image quality. There was yeah. never that real punch. It always got a bit soft and everything. And also lost autofocus capabilities. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And for me, it changed my world when I started using this. So this image was taken at um, a 400 with 1.4 times converter at night at 10,000 ISO. So again, we're talking this incredible image quality with amazing ability, and I never lost anything. It's dark, and we were talking about autofocus now, Marlon. Dark, that thing held on to its eye. I have Atmos footage, which we'll share on social media so that everyone can just see how amazing this thing is. But it locks onto the eye, and even with that converted, you get great image quality and great autofocus. Marlon, you also have this image. Yeah, Richard, you know, like you say, I think teleconverters has been a, especially the two times teleconverters, a bit of a controversial topic because I certainly never owned or used one when I, when I shot with DSLRs. It doesn't matter which DSLR I use. I always used the 1.4 and I used it fairly confidently. Um, but the two times was always no, no for me. And when I moved over to Sony, I, I just had to give it a go. And I promise you, I've not lost autofocus capabilities, which is the most important thing because, um, and you won't always notice it in good light, but when the light starts dropping or you have a, a tricky subject, you can see the lens struggling to maintain or to keep autofocus. Now with the Sony and the two times teleconverter, you keep your autofocus system, you keep edge to edge sharpness, which is a very important factor to consider. And very importantly, you also keep image quality, uh, a very like hardly noticeable reduction in image quality. And if you look at a photograph like this, this is the 600 F4 with a two times teleconverter. That's 1,200 millimeters on a leopard drinking. I was confident to use that setup on this cat and I came up with a beautiful image confidently shot with a two times teleconverter. Totally, and, and I think that's, that's where you guys have to realize it's not just with the converters, the 100, 400, which isn't the fastest lens in the world, or the 200, 600, which goes to 6.3. People go, that's a very slow lens. We have to now move things around. So 
you don't. The ISO on these cameras is so good. The low light capability is so good that you can shoot with all of these things at once. So we're going to go to some questions now and we'll take it from there. Absolutely. And yeah, as you guys have seen, it's unbelievable images, unbelievable yeah. gear. Okay, so we're basically going to jump into some questions. I have some questions that I'm also going to direct to them now. Um, so just to get this Q&A started. And also something that we are focusing on also now is the hashtag Sony 5 Steps. And it's basically the idea of what makes Sony 5 Steps ahead in the mirrorless game, in the wildlife game, specifically with regards to this, um, this webinar that we have today. So I'm going to jump into some questions and then they go ahead and answer it as they want. So first question, what makes Sony mirrorless five steps in in the game wildlife in general? What is your, what is your take on that? Well, first of all, for me, the start was, the reason why I changed was weight. I was carrying too much gear, it weighed me down, it just wasn't working. The second thing, because I waited for another make that I was shooting with to come out with their mirrorless version, it was just nowhere near. Sony are so far ahead because they are six years ahead. That is the literal statement. Next thing is lenses. So I don't know, what's your, your feel, Marlon? Um, exactly the same, Richard. I think for me, um, I, as I said earlier, I come from 12 years of professional camera equipment. So I wasn't um, uh, prone to shooting with not the best gear. I was always exposed to the best gear possible at the time. And Sony came along and just absolutely blew me away. And for me, um, the most important thing with, with wildlife photography is being confident that when I shoot, I'm going to get a result. I don't take as many photos as what I used to. Um, I'm focused on my guests. I'm also a safari guide. So I'm always you know, making sure my guests are getting the shot. But when I do pick up the camera and I shoot, it's usually a good moment. And I don't want to mess that up. So what I get in the A92 is something built for professionals. If I pick it up and I use it, I'm going to get the result that I'm after. And that's because of incredibly accurate and fast autofocus not only in the A9 or the A7, but also in the lenses. The lenses and the cameras both are up for the task. And the fact that I have the, probably one of the biggest things for me is just the autofocus system. It's customizable. I find myself changing my autofocus mode um, based on what I'm seeing, be it a smaller focus point, being the wide focus mode. I'm constantly adjusting my focus. And the fact that I have that, I'm not just stuck on one focus mode. I'm constantly using the best one for the task at hand, just plays right into my strength and allows me to capture the photographs that I do. Totally, and I think what you're saying there gives us so much room. One of the things when you change over to a new brand, firstly, is everyone's worried about, oh, but the buttons aren't the same and everything. Everything's customizable. And what I've found is it's a learning curve. So I don't mind changing settings and going, how does this work? It's actually been a joy. It's been refreshing because I'm not stuck in the same thing. Yeah. I'm trying to create new stuff. I don't know. And, and even like composition, how, how that focus works with composition. Yeah. All the way to the edges that allows you to track to the edges, birds in flight, uh, the focus points follow all the way left and right. And it just allows you to get the shot you do. So no doubt. I mean, just considering what we've spoken here, Sony 15, was it Sony 15 steps ahead or was it five? <laughs> I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> okay, so um, then another question. So you guys have done many trips, right? And if, if you could take one lens and one body, what would, what would that kit look like? Oh, I'm going to jump in because, because that 135, when we, were, when we were chatting and I've seen your images, right in the beginning of, of my idea as a brand ambassador was to try different things. And the one lens I want to try is the 135, 1.8 with the Gorillas. I think the, the portrait ability of that lens and coupled with something like the A7R4, so you get that real rich detail with this incredible lens with such deep uh, depth and being able to pull things out, push things back. I think that would be mine. What's yours? It's such a tough one because they're all really good. Um, but if I, you know, I, I'm a massive, massive fan of the 400 f2.8. And as you say, I love the 135. And if I have to choose one lens to take with me uh, for what I'm getting, probably something um, like a 7200. And I'll give you a little hack. If you use a, a camera like the a7R4 on the 7200, inside of the camera, you have in, in, in body camera crop. You can crop on the sensor APS-C to, to um, give you essentially a 1.5 times crop effect on the full frame sensor. 
And what's awesome about it then, on the 70 to 200, all of a sudden, at 27 million pixels, you get, I think, 110 to 350 mil lens. So you now add f2.8. So essentially, by cropping and using that function, you can manipulate the 70 to 200 to become not 200 f2.8, but 350 f2.8. And the best thing is if you were taking video with the crop sensor on, you still get the same frame rate, you still get 4K. And to me, that's such a great hack. And it's something I've been using quite a lot. So probably something like the 7200 and then having the versatility of that A7R4, still 27 million pixels and still the 4K video, which we all love. Yummy. So we have some questions now. I have some questions also, so I'm sharing them currently. So I have a next question. So lenses, it's a quite a technical thing and there's GMOS and RNG and there's this and that. And there's so much. But is there one lens that stood out for you? One lens that exceeded your expectation in this Sony range? I think, I think for me, it's the lens that I've been most fond of. I'm familiar with all the other lenses. I'm familiar with the 400, the 600. But the lens I've truly enjoyed using in a wildlife setting is the, I know we've spoken about it a fair bit, but the 135 f1.8. Um, I've shot my kids with it. I've shot my pets with it. Uh, I've taken it into a wildlife setting, into a landscape and both wildlife portraiture. And I have truly enjoyed the speed at which that lens focuses, the size. And, you know, I love something, although I love technology and I like things are getting, I also love picking up a small lens and feeling the weight of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you pick up that 135, you know it's built for a task. Um, and I just, it's old school that it, you can change your aperture on the lens itself with a bit of a click run through it. Um, and it's just, it's, just a, it's just a lovely lens and a lens that I've truly grown fond of. Yeah, I think mine is the 100-400. Firstly, because it was the first Sony lens that I shot through. And I didn't know where my expectations were when I got it. But the versatility of that lens blew my mind. From being able to zoom in close at 400 to go wide to 100 and capture an animal in situ in its landscape, in its space, with unbelievable image quality it literally blew my mind i had been shooting with professional quality lenses before the 200 400s 400 2.8 and the quality was better i i didn't know if i was doing something wrong before then and then also to be able to shoot macro be able to get close into something yeah it just blew me away we love sony just a little <laughs> And right again, we love you back. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have one more question here. Let me just go to it. So I want to make my first purchase on this uh, Black Friday, Black, call it Black November. Um, if I had to buy a body or I had to buy a lens, I mean, of course you need the body to get the lens, So, but I don't want to spoil it. So if somebody's got a body already, they, they can get a lens. If they don't have a body yet, we can talk about bodies. Yeah. But if I can only do one purchase, what would that purchase be? Marlon, you go. Yeah, thanks for selling me into that one. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Adam. Really you know, I think, um, you know, if, if uh, considering you're a Sony user and you want something new, um, I think you should, you know, looking at the A9 Mark II, uh, especially uh, at, the, at the price that it's going at now, it's a, it's a, it's a steal. It literally is a, a fantastic opportunity to, to get the best wildlife camera in the world right now uh, get that autofocus system the new buttons the, the 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 build quality the structure the weather ceiling it's it's all in there so you're buying one camera just it is it's an amazing deal and and a great camera to have uh, for for uh, at home your kids in the wild uh, any event it's just a great versatile camera to use that would be my one thing to go and grab so I'm totally with you, and I think... Are you going to say 1.4 teleconverter? No, no, no. I'm actually going to go a completely different route because I think there's a lot of people that are out there that might not be in that realm, and I would go with that RX-10. The RX-10 Mark IV is... A that's, that's cheating because that's technically a lens and a camera in one, but it's fine. You can go with that. I'm jumping the gun here, but, <laughs> um, but it's incredible. To have 24 mils, 2.8 through 600 f4, in a body that's this big and weighs nothing. Mm. I think for a lot of people, for a lot of people trying to test the waters, it allows you to still keep your bodies and everything and maybe have a second body as that. Um, but otherwise, anything else, the A92 is just a mind blower. It really is just absolutely takes it apart. Just want to say thanks to everyone who watched, guys. It's really, it's an amazing time. It's an exciting time for, for photography. 
it's time to wrap your head around things and there's time now to get to know your cameras. So go out and buy it. Yeah. And from my side, just to end, I know many of you think we, uh, we have to say these things. The reality is we're both professional wildlife photographers. We're both safari guides. We pride ourselves in the work we put out and we undertake these things on our own, regardless of being, whether it's a live or Sony on our own feeds, we believe in the gear, we believe in the equipment, and it's allowed us to capture incredible imagery and moments over the last, uh, well, many years for Richard and over the last year and a half for me. So I fully trust Sony and it is without a doubt the future of wildlife photography. That's perfect. So just so that you guys know, down here, it's like right here, you have the uh, tags of both Richard and Mon and also Sony Alpha SA. So you're welcome to go follow the pages or go check it out or whatever it may be. If you make a purchase, you're welcome to also send us a picture. You can use the, the hashtag that we have. It's a Sony Alpha 5, no, it's Sony 5 Steps. Um, so you can use that, you can tag us in it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it from our side. So thank you so much for tuning in for this one and we'll probably see you in the next one.